Hello, everyone. And on behalf of the Office of Alumni Relations and Development and the Institute of Politics here at the University of Chicago, welcome. My name is Robert Deans. I'm a second year in the college majoring economics. Last quarter, I served as an IOP Fellows Ambassador to former Congressman Will Hurd of the Texas 23rd. Thank you for joining us for this virtual conversation between IOP Director David Axelrod and our distinguished guest and University of Chicago Law School alumna, Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Congresswoman Cheney is the at-large representative for Wyoming in the U.S. House of Representatives, holding the seat that her father, Vice President Dick Cheney, once held. She currently serves on the Armed Services Committee and the Subcommittees for Military Personnel and Strategic Forces. Representative Cheney is the former chair of the House Republican Conference, the third ranking leadership position in the House of Representatives for the Republican Party, and formerly served as Deputy, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs in the George W. Bush administration. A staunch conservative, Representative Cheney is an outspoken on her reverence for the rule of law and our constitution, the need to restore America's power and strength around the world and cutting taxes and regulations. David Axrod will moderate this event. David is the founding director of the Institute of Politics, senior political commentator for CNN, and the host of the podcast, The Axe Files and Hacks on Tap. David previously served as the chief strategist and senior advisor to Barack, President Barack Obama and spent eight years as a reporter and columnist for the Chicago Tribune. We are honored to have Congresswoman Cheney join us for the last IOP speaker series event of the year. This past year, the IOP has welcomed nearly 100 speakers, hosted 14 fellows who led seminars for our students, provided funding for over 330 internships, and supported six student-led civic engagement programs. All of these programs are part of the IOP's mission to inspire the next generation of public service leaders. To learn more about the Institute, please check out politics.uchicago.edu. With that, I will turn it over to Congresswoman Cheney and Mr. Axelrod. Thank you, Robert. Congresswoman Cheney, welcome. Uh, welcome back to the <laughs> University of Chicago. It's it's great uh, to have you. What were you you were here in the in the mid nineties in, in the law school? What what drew you to the university in the first place? And what was your experience like here? What's what's the most memorable part of it? Well, well, thank you, first of all, for, for having me, David. Thank you uh, uh, very much for, for your leadership in a whole range of areas, including uh, at the Institute of Politics now. Um, my most memorable experience at the University of Chicago uh, was uh, having my first baby. Uh, our, our oldest daughter was, was born uh, two weeks before the end of my first year of law school, born there at the University of Chicago Hospital. And um, so that she, and she will, she's getting married this summer. So that tells you mm -hmm. how long ago that Congratulations. was. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But uh, no, it was a, a wonderful place. Um, I actually uh, applied to the law school and got in and then um, deferred a couple of years because I was working at the Agency for International Development and the uh, uh, wall had come down in 1989 and I was working in the bureau that was handling uh, the programs to help uh, privatize and uh, you know, uh, encourage democracy, uh, help build market economies uh, in, in those countries that had been uh, behind the Iron Curtain and then in the former Soviet Union. And uh, so the law school very uh, nicely let me defer to two times and then I started in uh, the fall of 93. Um, you know, I just, uh, it, it strikes me as kind of ironic, I'm sure it strikes you as ironic, that um, you, you're now probably very uh, welcome and celebrated figure on campuses across the country. Cheney name has not been PC all the time in the last, uh, in the last uh, two decades. Um, but uh, uh, tell me about your, uh, a little bit about your, your upbringing and uh, you were your your parents both were speaking about not necessarily PC. They were two conservative PhD students at the University of Wisconsin in the late '60s. So uh, that that was unusual. Um, and then they moved to Washington. And your dad, at a very early age, was the chief of staff to uh, President Ford. You would have been a young young person, very young person, nine, ten years old at that time. What do you recall of those years? And was it always just assumed in your head that someday I am going to serve, and someday I may go into politics myself? Well, um, what what I recall of the of the Ford years in particular, uh, when when my dad was the chief of staff, 
Uh, of course, as chief of staff, your hours are very long. And my sister and I were young and uh, he wanted to be able to spend as much time as he could with us. And so he would uh, bring us down to the White House on the weekends. On Saturday mornings, uh, we would go with him uh, to his office in the West Wing, which is still the chief of staff's office to this day. And um, the height of technology in 1974, 1975, uh, was that he had a wall that had multiple televisions in the wall. So you could put each one on a different network. And Mary and I would uh, sit on the floor of his office in the West Wing and turn each television to a different cartoon show because then you could <laughs> only watch cartoons on Saturday mornings uh, and, and sit and watch multiple cartoons. Um, the other thing was that uh, for a while, his office, he was the deputy chief of staff when Don Rumsfeld was the chief of staff. And uh, in those days, outside Don Rumsfeld's office, uh, in, in uh, one of his assistant's desk drawers, it was just a drawer full of candy. And so Mary and I would spend a lot of time surveying the candy in that drawer and then, uh, then go watch our cartoons. Um, but I, you know, I don't, I don't think I assumed, you know, uh, always that I would get involved in politics, but I certainly um, knew that uh, what was happening, you know, from a public affairs perspective, from a, a policy perspective, those were always topics we talked about at home uh, around the dinner table. And so there were always things I was, I was very interested in. Um, and, and certainly watching both my parents be involved in, in careers that, you know, let them engage in, in the important issues of the day, things that were sort of bigger than, than self, uh, was very, was inspirational. Uh, and so I think certainly that plus the love of history that both my parents instilled in us um, definitely uh, informed my, my ultimate decisions about, about career path. And your career, I mean, you spent, you point, point out early years at the State Department at uh, USAID um, uh, and then ran for office in Wyoming. Uh, and your rise in the House was uh, very, very swift uh, to the number three uh, position in the House. Um, your, 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 uh, your release from that position was just as swift. Um, and obviously, you've been thrust into a great deal of controversy and debate about President Trump what his role should be in the Republican Party, and about your own future, your campaigning. You're in, I assume you're in Wyoming now. I'm actually in uh, in D.C. now, but I just just got back last night. So tell me what uh, tell me uh, the reaction you've heard from your own constituents uh, about the position you took on January 6th on President Trump and about the decision of the House to uh, dispatch you as the conference chair. Well, um, you know, it is uh, first of all, I think, important to uh, understand that Wyoming uh, uh, gave President Trump a larger margin of victory than than any other state in the country, both in 2016 and in, in 2020. And uh, the the policies that, that President Trump pursued are policies that uh, those of us in Wyoming support. And, and they're important policies in terms of deregulation and tax cuts, uh, resources for strong national defense. Um, so we're a very conservative state uh, I'm a conservative Republican, um, but we are also a state that that reveres the Constitution and um, understands and, and reveres the um, the important role of uh, you know the oath that we all take. Uh, those of us who are serving in, in elected office, you know, people who've served in a whole range of, of positions, we take we take that oath. And so, as I talk to my constituents across Wyoming, certainly. Uh, there are people who um, disagree with with my vote to impeach. Um, certainly, there are people who uh, are angry, uh, but there are also many, many people who um, uh, express gratitude uh, for um, putting the Constitution above politics um, and and recognize and understand how fragile our system is. And um, you know, we're a small state population wise, obviously a large state geographically, but um, serving the people of Wyoming and, and campaigning in Wyoming has always been very much um, characterized by talking to people individually, having the chance to really sit down and, and hear from people, hear their perspectives, explain my views and perspectives. And so I, I've been very um, 
inspired and heartened, frankly, uh, by those discussions and conversations over the last you know, number of months now, certainly since uh, January 6th and since, since the impeachment vote. And we'll talk about your, your race out there in, in a bit. Uh, we all heard your statement when you uh, stood on the floor of the House the day before the conference voted to uh, relieve you of your uh, position. It, did, it wasn't lost on me that um, most of your Republican colleagues left the floor when you took to the microphone. It felt a little like high school, uh, but or at least for me, it felt like high school, which says something about me. But um, uh, did what, what are those relationships like now? Uh, between you and because I get the sense that there are a lot of people there who probably agree with you, but find it inconvenient that you're you keep raising the, these these uh, points about January 6th and the way the president conducted himself. Well, I, I would say a couple of things. Uh, when I spoke on the House floor, um, it was during a special order time. There, there wasn't sort of a mass exodus of, of members from the floor. Uh, was it was much more sort of the natural flow of things. Um, you know, I think we're we're living through an unprecedented era. Uh, we're living through a moment in our politics that uh, I, I don't think we've seen before. Um, and you know, a moment where you have a former president who um, you know refused to accept the fact that he lost the election, continues to refuse to accept the fact, uh, provoked an attack on the Capitol. Uh, while we were counting electoral votes, refused to send help when the attack was underway, uh, and, and has continued to this day to use language that he knows uh, provokes violence. And so I, I think it's, um, it's a very consequential moment in, in our politics. And uh, it's a time when there certainly are members, and, and I've had a number of members say things to me like, you know, we would have voted to impeach, but we were concerned about our security. Uh, and, and I think that in some ways people have sort of glossed over that, but I think that's a very important point to pause and, and contemplate uh, that you have members of the United States House of Representatives um, for whom you know, security, their personal security or their family security, uh, their, their concerns about that affected the way that they felt they could vote. That, that's a really uh, significant thing to, to say about the, the current state of our politics. So, you not have those concerns about your own uh, security. You've been such a fo focus of attention and, and ugly attention on, in some quarters of social media. And uh, it, what, what are your concerns for you and your family? Well, I mean, I think certainly we, we all have those concerns. Um, you know, I think that um, uh, what, what concerns me also, though, is the idea that my kids might grow up in a country that isn't characterized by the peaceful transition of power. And, and I realize that's also a very kind of a grave thing to say. But, but I did have a, a moment of realization after the 6th and, and after the impeachment vote. Um, you know, looking at that, our two youngest are our sons. And, you know, looking at my boys at dinner one night and thinking, you know, we grew up in a country where power transferred peacefully and where we could take that for granted and, and wondering suddenly, are they going to grow up in a country where that isn't taken for granted, where that's not something they can count on. And, and I think all of us, no matter what our party affiliation is, have an obligation to, to defend that very most fundamental aspect of, of, you know, our Republic. And, and I think that's very, very important. Have you stepped up your your own security though, in as a result of all of this, I have. I don't want to get into details about it, but sure, it's it's certainly something we're we're all focused on. Um, you said the president uh, still hasn't accepted his defeat. There were reports this week that he uh, is thinking somehow he'll be reinstated by by August. Um, what does that? What do reports like that that travel virally? Uh, what do they do to, to, to sort of gin up uh, concern about political violence and some of the things that we saw on January 6th? I think it's a very real threat and it's an ongoing threat. And I think that that President Trump's continued activities um, demonstrate the, the falsity of the idea that if we simply ignore him, he'll go away. 
Um, there are some in my party who are embracing him. Uh, there are some who don't want to embrace him, who don't want him to be part of the future of the party or the country, but who think that we can get to that point by simply ignoring him. And, and I, I just don't believe that. I think that um, because he continues to, to pose the kind of threat that you've described, um, and because he is perpetuating a lie about the functioning of our uh, electoral system that is toxic to the democracy, I believe as a party, uh, and I believe as Americans and as elected officials, we, we have to stand against that. We have to tell people the truth uh, and, and we have to fight for the truth. And we've got to build our party back uh, on a foundation that embraces the constitution, embraces fidelity to the constitution, and that, that you know we have to be very clear to say a president who did what Donald Trump did has no role to play in the future of the nation. He simply can't, it's too dangerous. But you know, and I'm sure you were told by your colleagues during this period uh, that many of them, including uh, uh, Leader McCarthy, believe that they need Trump. You know, uh, you know, Lindsey Graham said, we can't, we can't move forward without him. Uh, that, you know, you need to placate Trump for the Republican Party to succeed. Um, you obviously have a different view on that. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think that's wrong from uh, a moral perspective. Uh, I think it's wrong from a constitutional perspective. Uh, as I said, when when a president commits the kind of violations of his oath that Donald Trump did, uh, he he disqualifies himself. Um, and so, you know, from a uh, the perspective of what is right and wrong, he should not be part of our party or our our. Uh, national politics going yeah, forward. Yeah, but what about the politics of it? Yeah, and, and on the politics of it as well. You know, when Donald Trump was president, we lost the House, the Senate, and the White House. And I think it's the only time, you know, it was 100 years prior to that, that that happened in, in a president's term in office. And so uh, I think from a political perspective, it's also uh, a mistake. And, you know, I think if you if you look at what the Republican Party has to do in order to be able to win elections, put in place the policies we believe in, uh, we really do have to attract back voters who left us. We've got to attract back independents. Uh, we've got to be clear that, you know, the voters who came to the party because of Donald Trump's policies, uh, you know, I think that it's very important for us not to be conveying the idea that we're we're rejecting those voters because certainly we aren't. Um, but I, I think it's important for us to say, you know, we we are rejecting what happened on the sixth, and uh, and and the president who provoked what happened on the sixth. That that's a very hard uh, kind of balance to strike because uh, a majority of Republican voters agree with not what happened on the sixth but they agree with his interpretation uh, of the election. Um, and um, I, I want to ask you about that a little bit more about that in a second. But, you know, it struck it struck me I, I, again. I was I, I as someone who cares deeply about this democracy. I was moved by your remarks. And um, uh, uh, but it struck me if, if I as a caucus had made the decision that we were going to play along with Trump, then and you uh, you're the conference chair in charge of the messaging of the conference. It was an untenable situation, wasn't it? it was, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it became clear that to stay in leadership, I would have to be willing to perpetuate the lie. And I wasn't willing to do that. So so it was it was untenable. That's absolutely right. Did you ha did you actually have that conversation with McCarthy? Did he did did was it just that clear? Um, we did not have that conversation, uh, but I think it became increasingly clear, you know, when um, we had a press conference uh, and I was asked whether or not President Trump should be prosecuted. Uh, and I said that was up to the Justice Department, but that I really uh, think it's important for us to have a commission, a bipartisan commission uh, that, that looks at what happened in the lead up to January 6th, that looks at what caused it. You know, I was taking a position that was very different from the one that uh, Leader McCarthy, Whip Scalise had taken, but I believe it is the only position you can take in terms of what's right for the country and, and you know, understanding what happened uh, on that day, understanding what caused the attack mm -hmm. and how we prevent it in the future. And, but um, my, my question to you as, as a very pragmatic 
and smart uh, politician is, uh, you know, they were criticized and I criticized them uh, for their decision. But once they made the decision that they were going to play along on that and try and brush the events of the sixth under the rug, um, you, you were you were you were unviable for them. Uh, I suppose that's right. Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's a wrong decision, not, not because of, of me, but again, for the party to be in a position yeah, where they tied themselves to that position now. Yeah, I mean, and, and um, this isn't a policy disagreement, you know, this is uh, the president provoking an attack on the Capitol to prevent us from counting electoral votes. And, both McCarthy and Scalise, certainly uh, McCarthy, made clear that he understood that that's what had happened in his remarks on the floor on January 13th. So there was no question in the days after the attack what had happened. There was no question who was responsible then. Um, but but then, of course, uh, Kevin McCarthy decided to go to Mar-a-Lago uh, at the end of mm-hmm. January. And and I think that, that was a real moment where it became clear we weren't going to be able to... Um, move forward and focus on substance and policy um, because we had leaders who were embracing um, the, the president who had just been impeached. Did you, did you know before he was going that he was going? I didn't. And what did you, I mean, what was your reaction when you saw the, the video on the screen? I was, uh, I was stunned. I could not imagine uh, any justification for doing that. Um, and, uh, and I asked him why he had done it. And, you know, he said, well, he had just been in the neighborhood essentially. Um, but, but it's, um, no, I just, I, you know, as I said, I think what, what Donald Trump did is um, the most dangerous thing, the, the most egregious violation of uh, an oath of office of any president in our history. And so the idea that a few weeks after he did that, um, the leader of the Republicans in the house would be at Mar-a-Lago uh, essentially, you know, uh, pleading with him to to somehow, you know, come back into the the fold uh, or whatever it was he was doing to me was uh, was inexcusable. And what was your conversation with him like after that? You must have confronted him on it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but but as I said, I asked him why he had done it, and you know, his answer was uh, unsatisfactory. I, but again, I, I don't think there was any answer he could have given. Um, you know that that. That would have been, yeah, yeah. You must have seen Vice President Pence's uh, comments the other night, which he said, I don't know that, I don't think we'll ever see eye to eye, he and President Trump on the events of January 6th, but I'm proud of the four years uh, uh, record before that. Um, can, Can you walk that line? Look, I think that Vice President Pence deserves tremendous tremendous gratitude uh, for the courage that he showed on January 6th. Um, I I know that he was under tremendous pressure, including on the day of January 6th, um, to discard electoral votes, to announce that he was rejecting slates of electors, to announce he was sending them back to state legislatures. Uh, He was under real pressure to act in a way that was unconstitutional, and and he didn't do it. And, uh, you know, when it became clear he wouldn't do it, as we all now know, President Trump sent a tweet out saying he didn't have the courage to do what was necessary, and that incited, you know, sort of a, a target on his back. Attacks. Right. So, so I think he deserves tremendous credit for standing firm. Uh, and uh, um, that that said, what I'm asking though, he he clearly has some aspirations to maybe run for president himself. Can you can you say I disagree with Donald Trump on January sixth, uh, but uh, I. Uh, embrace everything else and move on and succeed. First of all, is that an intellectually uh, sustainable position? And secondly, is it a politically sustainable position in this Republican Party? Do you have to choose on that? Well, I mean, what I what I guess I'd say is my own personal view is that the issues between Election Day and January 6th and the way the president has conducted himself, President Trump, since then, um, they're not policy disputes, uh, you know. So I, I see it differently. I don't think this is something where you can um, act as though it's a policy dispute or a disagreement about what happened. Um, you know, you have a president who 
tried to steal the election. And when he wasn't able to, you know, he, he exercised his legitimate rights through the court system. That was legitimate. And, and he had the right to do that. But when that failed, um, you know, he then started uh, trying to strong arm locally elected officials. Uh, they also, a number of them deserve huge credit for not, not <laughs> bowing to that pressure. Um, and then when that failed, he, you know, started telling everybody, to come to uh, DC on the 6th, that somehow they were gonna change things then and using language like it's a war and you need to fight to the death. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's very clear that the president violated the constitution, violated his oath of office. I don't think that's a, that there's a disagreement there. You know, one thing when I heard his, uh, Vice President Pence's remarks that occurred to me was, and I wanna ask you about this and, and your own thoughts on this. It wasn't just after the election that the president was casting doubt on the election. It was before the election as well. For months before the election, he was telling crowds of people that if we don't win, it will be a fr fraudulent election. Um, what were you thinking when you heard those things? Because I know you spoke out on, I think, December 20th, which is when the, you know, uh, when the court cases were pretty much uh, decided certification was going to happen, um, maybe did happen. Um, but you, were you uncomfortable when you heard his remarks leading up to the election? Uh, yes, and, and there were a number of occasions where I spoke out um, with respect to things like guaranteeing the peaceful transition of power, um, you know, even before we got, got to the election. Uh, and then uh, after the election, I did as well. Um, but uh, I, I think I think what he was doing clearly, we you know at the time um, was wrong, and uh, we now know how dangerous it was. And the other thing that occurs to me is when you listen to Donald Trump talk now, when you hear the language he's using now, it is um, essentially the same things that the Chinese. Communist Party, for example, says about the United States and our democracy. And I think it's important for people to, to also stop and think about that for a moment. Uh, when he says that our system doesn't work, that our, our democratic process, when he suggests that it, it's, you know, incapable of conveying the will of the people, um, you know, that somehow it's failed. Those are the same things that, that the Chinese government says about us. And, and it's very dangerous and damaging. And it's, and it's not true. You know, um, I, I want to ask this question without judgment, because you do represent a state that strongly, strongly supported President Trump. And as you point out, is quite uh, conservative. And your voting record reflects that you, you supported Trump's positions, I think, 93 percent of the time, which really underscores the the meaning of the decision to toss you out as uh, as as conference chair. But, you know, after the last election in 2016, uh, Trump uh uh, contended that he had actually won the popular vote, which he had lost by three million, appointed a commission to find evidence of that, which they could not. And there were all kinds of incursions on, you know, rule of law and other, uh, you know, with the, you know, relative to the Department of Justice, relative to the FBI, um, certainly relative to the, uh, you know, there were concerns about his uh uh, relationship with the intelligence community and so on. Wh what were you thinking through all of that? I mean, and I, the, re the reason I say I ask without judgment is because you're a practicing politician and, and I have some sympathy for, uh, for the pressures that that uh, entails. But uh, I mean, how many times did you just bite your tongue and say, you know, uh, this is, this is really off kilter, but I got to hold my fire here. Well, I think if you go back and look, you'll see a um, number of times that I spoke out. Uh, you know, I remember um, when President Trump stood next to uh, Vladimir Putin yes. uh, at that Helsinki press conference and yes. suggested that he believed Putin over our own intelligence agency. Yes. And you made a very strong statement then. Yeah. And, and so... There were a number of occasions where I did speak out um, when President Trump announced that he uh, was going to um, essentially order all states to take action with respect to uh, 
I think that was in connection with COVID actually, that he was going, you know, he, he himself had the authority to order all of the states to do X, Y, or Z. Mm-hmm. And, and I spoke out then and said, no, that is not how the constitution works in this regard. Um, and so I think that there were a number of cases, certainly a number of instances over the course of his presidency where I disagreed and I spoke out about those. There were a number of places where the policies were good and, and I supported those. And I think one of those, for example, is, um, what he did to provide resources for the Defense Department. I think that was mm-hmm. really crucial. Um, and so I, I think, you know, from a policy perspective, you can go back and say, here's where we agreed and here's where we disagreed. Uh, once you get into the, the, the fundamental attacks on the electoral process and then, uh, you know, what happened on January 6th, um, you know, that, that's nothing to do with policy. And it, it yeah, should be right. But like the commission back in 2017 had nothing to do with uh, policy. That was that was a, a piece of what we saw evolve on January uh, 6. So and you knew that. I mean, you knew that it was crazy to suggest that three million votes, uh, the three million vote margin was somehow fraudulent. You, you knew that then. But I think that. Um what we are dealing with now and and what we saw with respect to the violence in the aftermath of the 2020 election um you know uh is something that that reaches new levels of danger for the nation and and you know you'll appreciate i'm i'm sure david one of the ways that i explain my vote to my constituents is you know i say to them you need to imagine if it were barack obama doing these things if it were barack obama who you know, had had stolen the election, had tried to steal the election, had been pressuring local Democratic officials to to change results and to find votes. That that's how we need to think about this. Yeah, you know, um, uh, as as I'm, you mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier the there are a lot of uh, the majority of Republicans accept have accepted the story that the uh, that the election was fraudulent, and uh, this has given rise to all over the country, um, uh, initiatives by state legislatures to uh, uh, to uh, restrict in different ways uh, voting in the states. And when you ask the supporters of these propositions why they're doing it, um, there's no particular incident of fraud uh, that they point to, because in most of the states, these elections were certifiably good and honest and um, so they say, well, it's because people have s- doubts about the election process. So it's kind of a weird thing, isn't it? Where you say, uh, where, where you perpetuate a fraud and then you legislate to deal with the fraudulent facts that you've propagated out there. Well, look, I, I think several things I would say. One is, um, that, uh, all of the laws that we're seeing now that are, have been passed in a number of states, uh, it's wrong to lump them all together. It's wrong to say, uh, you know, that that these laws are, you know, by definition um, meant as uh, some perpetuation of this this broader claim that President Trump is making. Uh, and I'm sure that they will be they'll be tested uh, in court, and and courts will decide, um, you know, in in each case. Uh, whether or not those laws, um, you know, can stand. And, and I think that's important. I, I think we can't, you, you can't sit back and say, because, um, you know, the legislators in some state decide that they want to um, put restrictions or, um, you know, uh, make new rules about mail-in voting or absentee voting, that by definition, that that is, you know, an attempt at voter suppression. Uh, I, I think we have to be responsible at analyzing the pieces of each one of those laws. Um, and it's certainly true there was fraud in the election. There's there's fraud in every election. And so I don't think, you know, we certainly can't say this was a perfect election or that it was free of fraud. We know that the, that, um, the fraud that President Trump alleged, uh, he was unable to prove. And, you know, in every 62 different courts, including judges he appointed, um, rejected his claims. So it, I think we, you know, we have to be clear that we're going to abide by the rule of law, and that applies to the the new election laws that are being passed now as well. Uh, but it is unhealthy for a democracy if large numbers of people think that the election process was not free and fair and honest. Well, and I, that is a really important point. I think 
And, and that's a point about what is our job as elected leaders. And um, too many of my colleagues take the approach of saying, well, you know, vast numbers of Republicans believe this uh, as though our actions don't have any impact on that. And, and I think all of us, Republicans and Democrats um, and the news media uh, have an obligation to tell people the truth, have an obligation to say to people, listen, this is what happened. This is the reality of what happened. Um, you know, looking for ways, for example, if you look at the audit, the so-called audit, which isn't really an audit that's going on now in Maricopa County, Arizona, People need to know the truth about that. They need to know the truth about how many times those ballots have been counted and recounted. And the fact that the company that's been hired to do it now has never done this before. Um, you know, it, it is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fraudulent audit. And I think it's, it's important and incumbent upon those of us who are elected um, to recognize that um, we have the ability and the responsibility to impact what people believe and, and, and making sure people have the truth. We have to tell people the truth. And um, simply saying the majority of Republicans believe the election was stolen, you know, to me that says we aren't doing our job well enough to make sure people have the facts to understand it wasn't stolen. And we, we don't like the outcome, but that doesn't mean it wasn't stolen. Or that doesn't mean it was stolen. Yeah, one, one good quick question about the first impeachment, which you opposed. Um, did you have concerns about the call that, that the president made to the president of Ukraine? I was trying to imagine uh, Vice President Dick Cheney picking up that, the phone in 2003 and calling a foreign leader and asking them to open up a uh, investigation on John Kerry. I mean, it, it wouldn't have, I just, it was, that would be inconceivable to me. I did have concerns about it. Um, and I think that if, if you look though at, um, what the Democrats, the, the path that the Democrats pursued, um, you know, again, uh, impeachment is a really serious and grave step. And uh, as we watched that impeachment trial unfold, as we watched the witnesses the Democrats called, um, they didn't prove the case. And, uh, you know, they, they should have um, pursued the subpoenas. Um, they should have been in a position, frankly, where um, they, they, if they were going to make these claims, if they were going to make these charges, they, they needed to prove the case. And I, I looked very carefully. I read the depositions. I, I watched the testimony. Um, and, you know, uh, you can't impeach a president because somebody said they heard somebody else say something. Um, you, you have to prove your case. And so uh, to me, that impeachment was very different than, than the impeachment for the activities leading up to and on January 6th. Do you think that that impeachment acquittal um, emboldened Trump? Um, I don't, I mean, I, you know, I, I hate to, uh, I don't think I, I could, um, you know, sort of get inside his mind. On <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's an interesting place to be. Um, you did, um, you know, there were, there were several places in which you have taken the president on, as you mentioned, and one of them was around the whole issue of the handling of the pandemic. And you tweeted this uh, tweet of your dad wearing a mask and it said, uh, real men wear masks. And it was a very clear message uh, about that. Help me understand how masks and vaccinations have become such a cultural and political flashpoint in our politics. And I'm sure you hear it in your own state as you move around. Well, it's, it's really too bad. You know, masks and, and vaccines shouldn't be political. Um, and, you know, as we dealt with the pandemic over the course of the last year, uh, there were many debates about what the right approach was. We had many different states that, that handled the pandemic differently. Um, and, and, but none of that should have been political. Uh, and I think that, you know, um, I think President Trump's mishandling uh, of the pandemic uh, is, is going to be part of his legacy. And, um, it, you know, it just it, it should not have gotten to the point that it did. Um, you know, I, I think that that um, one of the real, um, you know, um, innovative successes, obviously, that, that we've seen and that the Trump administration deserves credit for mm -hmm. uh, the development of the vaccines. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's it's mixed. I think this is a place where Vice President Pence deserves credit again. 
um, for for his handling of the task force. Um, but you know, it should never have been a political issue whether somebody put a mask on or not. Um, you, the other uh, another point in which you uh, differed was uh, with these attacks on Dr. Fauci, uh, who you defended uh, was a medal. A, a, he received the Medal of Freedom from President Bush uh, for his work on the AIDS epidemic. Um, tell me what you think about what's going on right now. Uh, you know, the emails surfaced that raised questions about whether he, um, uh, whether he uh, was uh, aggressive enough about this theory, which is still a theory about where the virus started, whether it was from a lab or from a, a bat uh, jumping to humans. Um, uh, have you changed your thinking at all about Dr. Fauci? I haven't. I, you know, Dr. Fauci is somebody I've known for many years. Uh, I, I stand by my support for him. Um, you know, I think that uh, you've got some of the same people now who are insistent um, on an investigation into the origins of COVID, which I support. I think that's very important. I think we need to have that. But, but there's some of the same people who denied that COVID was, was even a problem, you know, a year ago. Um, and so I think there's, again, a lot of uh, politicization that's gone on. Um, and I think it's, it's important for us to, to look back at the management of the pandemic to understand um, what went right and what went wrong, to learn from it. Um, but I, uh, I remain um, a, a supporter of uh, Dr. Fauci and the work he's done for the country throughout his career, including over the course of the last year. You know, you talked earlier about the peaceful transition of power. I, can, I have to tell you that um, I was in awe of the um, of the level of co cooperation uh, and uh, help that we got from President Bush in the transition transition 2008. And as you are well aware, it wasn't because he loved everything we said in that campaign. I'm pretty certain of that. <laughs> I'm sure that's right. <laughs> but he uh, but he felt that he, as a trustee of the of our democracy. Uh, had an obligation to see to it that there was a, a, a good and peaceful uh, transfer of power. He was very personally encouraging to some of us, which is something I will uh, never forget. Now, four years later, not only did we not have that, but you were, uh, you were chastised uh, on, online and in various precincts uh, for simply greeting the president of the United States uh, in April at his uh, at his speech to a joint session of Congress. Um, how, do, how does a democracy function if we, uh, if we can't even acknowledge our own, you know, our respective humanity? And if we begin from the assumption that if you disagree with me, you're not as much of an American as I am. I think it's, it's a problem. Uh, you know, I think if you, if you look at the, the set of challenges and threats that we're facing as a country, um, you know, whether you're talking about the, the global threats from China, from Russia, Iran, North Korea, uh, whether you're talking about the economic challenges, uh, the spending, um, you know, what we're facing domestically recovering from, from COVID, these are really serious issues and, and they require uh, a seriousness of purpose um, and, a, and a commitment to substance uh, in order to be able to deal with them effectively. And too often now we have incentivized people uh, to get involved in politics, incentivize the wrong people, you know, or, or uh, encourage people who come to Washington and decide they wanna be social media stars and they don't really wanna do the hard work. And I think that's a place where, you know, in both parties, all of us, as voters have an obligation to, to support people who are serious and to recognize there are big policy divides, big things we disagree on. We ought to you know, debate, discuss, fight those out. Uh, and uh, then you know, recognize, as, as you said, that we're not enemies, we're opponents in some cases. Some cases we'll be able to work together on things, but um, the, the challenges we face are, are too serious um, to, to have people who aren't serious, um, you know, in the lead no, of dealing with just them. On, on that point, um, you know, what was stunning to a lot of us was when the caucus met, uh, and on the same day, they, uh, did nothing about, uh, Marjorie, uh, Taylor Green and some of her, um, outrageous, uh, comments, um, 
but they voted on whether you should remain as conference chair. Um, what, what should, now we've seen additional, and you've been outspoken about it, uh, her comparing being asked to wear a mask on the House floor to the Holocaust. Um, what, what should the Republican conference do about her? Should there not be some uh, action taken on the part of the conference itself? Adam Kinzinger suggested she should be expelled from the conference. Look, I think that the conference um, and the party uh, has to be very clear. Um, you know, uh, Leader McCarthy likes to talk about a big tent, and I think that's important. We want to have a big tent, but 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 no tent should be big enough that it includes anti-Semites, uh, racists, bigots. We have members of at least one member of the House Republican Conference who continues to appear at white nationalist events. Um, and and I, I, I've spoken out against him. Um, and, and I think those, those views, um, people who espouse them, um, th th they just have no place in our party. They should have no place in our politics. Uh, I think the same is true for members of the Democratic caucus, um, members like Ilan Omar. Uh, and I think the Democrats ought to be responsible for um, members in their, their caucus who also have engaged in, in speech that, that has no place in our public discourse. Um, so I, I think this is one place that, that again, it, it's connected to January 6th. Um, when you look at um, the symbols of white supremacy, the fact that a Confederate flag flew in the Capitol that day, the fact that um, you had uh, Holocaust deniers, um, uh, you know, you had this, the symbols and the insignia of those things uh, with the people on the people who invaded the Capitol. I think our party has to be very clear that that's not who we are. The, you know, we, we, we reject that. We stand against it. We will fight against it. And people who espouse those views uh, don't have a place uh, in our party. Our tent cannot be that big. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we must draw the line. You've got a tough race uh, coming up uh, next year. President Trump has made it clear that he wants to target you. And uh, you've got eight opponents now. There may be more or less uh, come, uh, <laughs> come next year. Um, but uh, assuming that you navigate that rocky terrain. Um, uh, that you, you, I know you've been asked about this notion as to whether you would run for president in 2000 and, uh, and 24. I don't expect you to answer that here, um, but you haven't ruled it out either. And I'm wondering what, what would provoke you uh, to even consider that uh, in 2024? Well, I am uh, certainly focused, as, as you, you won't be surprised, on my reelection. As you should be. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's the, the race, particularly my primary race, is going to be unlike, I think, any House primary that we've seen certainly in a long time, because the, the fundamental issue, the question at the heart of my primary race will be um, you know, assuming Donald Trump endorses somebody, which I, I assume he will, uh, it'll be a choice for the voters of Wyoming between a candidate who's pledged loyalty to Donald Trump, loyalty to one man, um, and, uh, and me, uh, who has demonstrated loyalty to uh, the people of Wyoming, loyalty to the Constitution above all. And, and I think it's a, it will, will be a very clear message for the rest of the country about where the Republican Party is. Uh, it's an opportunity for the voters of Wyoming um, to send a clear message about rebuilding our party on a foundation of truth uh, and, and on a foundation of, of principles of, of adherence to the rule of law and to the Constitution. And so I, I really, I think it's, it's a very important race. Uh, obviously, you know, if I weren't in it, I would think that, but I, I think it's, it's really a race where uh, we're going to send a message to the rest of the country. And, and I, I, uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, I uh, am, am uh, prepared to, will fight very hard and, and expect that I'll be able to prevail. I knew you were too good to answer that question. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and if I were advising you, I would have advised you to answer it just, just <laughs> as you did. Um, we do have questions for you, Congresswoman. And the first one comes from a student. Andre, you wanna step forward? Sure. Hello, Congresswoman. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Andre Gonoel. I'm a second year MPP at the Harris School. And uh, my question sort of concerns, I mean, we've talked all about this political chaos, this hyper partisanship that's really grappling our country right now. 
But what does that hyperpartisanship mean for our national security interests and our credibility in terms of foreign policy, our ability to deal multilaterally and even bilaterally with allies and so on, when we sort of see you know, a swaying between the two political parties every four or eight years? Yeah, well, it's a great question, Andre. I think, you know, the the rest of the world has gotten accustomed to the fact that we do have this, you know, every four years, every eight years, we, we change, uh, potentially we change parties uh, in charge. I think what's what's different right now, and, um, you know, I, I know this from hearing from friends of mine who are in governments overseas or who used to be in governments overseas, that, you know, watching what happened on the 6th and sort of watching where the United States is today politically, I think it, it worries people. I think they they don't like it if it seems like the United States has lost its footing um, with respect to democracy. Uh, we we haven't lost our footing, um, but we've got to make sure we don't, and and we have to fight for it. And um, you know we have to be able to say to people around the world, particularly as we are engaged in what is going to be you know at least a generational. Uh, contest with great powers and, and the Chinese government in particular, we have to be able to demonstrate our strength and the strength of our values, the strength of our democracy. And I think that uh, is, is something that is even more important coming out of the last election. Uh, another reason why you know, we've, we've got to make sure that we get back to having our debates about policy and substance um, and uh, not this kind of fundamental attack on the foundations of the country that we've seen from, from Donald Trump. Thank you. Uh, we have an alum, uh, uh, Kwame, you wanna step up? Or well, I guess I'm reading this question uh, and I'm actually going to, uh, to uh, uh, alter it a bit because I think you, um, you answered it uh, earlier, but how do you see the current state level efforts to restrict access to voting? Uh, Congresswoman, let me take it to a different place, which is, um, uh, shouldn't, our, shouldn't our goal be in, in demonstrating the strength of our democracy to ensure that uh, the largest number of people who are, who, who, who are eligible to vote, obviously, but participate in our elections, that the more people participate in our elections, including the huge number that participated in this last election, uh, the more vibrant and healthy our democracy is. I think that's right. I think we should. I think we want to make sure that that everybody who is qualified to vote can. Uh, and I do. I think that's important. Um, I, I think that there are some basic things we ought to be doing, though. I, I believe we ought to have IDs. I think people should have to show an ID to vote. Um, you know, uh, one of my very first experiences as a poll watcher, David, was actually on the south side of Chicago when I was in law school, and I volunteered for the uh, the Cook County Republican Party uh, as a poll watcher. It must have been the '94 elections, and you know, I was the only Republican uh, at at this location where I had been sent. And um, I can tell you, the other people who were there had been doing this for a long time. It was a mental institution. Uh, and the voters who came in to vote, you know, were taken behind the 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 box, were taken basically into the ballot box, into the voting booth um, by people who were voting for them, and that should not have been going on. Uh, and um, so, you know, I, I've seen firsthand the kind of fraud that happens, and I think that we all ought to be committed to making sure everybody who's legally eligible to vote does, um, but that those people who aren't. Um, you know, that, that we do everything we can to prevent um, fraudulent voting. Do you see a lot of that in Wyoming? No, uh, I don't. Um, I, and I think that uh, part of what we have uh, that's, that's really, um, I think, a benefit of, of our system is that it's not a national system, that we have our, you know, individual states responsible for their elections. Uh, we've, we've been... Um, you know, very, very blessed uh, in Wyoming, uh, both at, at our county level and, and with our Secretary of State uh, throughout the course of the number of years, uh, and our elections work well there. Um, um, one of the I only ask because they just passed a voter ID law there. Yeah, and yeah. so if there's no problem, I'm, I'm wondering what problem you're solving for. I just, I guess I don't understand why people shouldn't have to show ID to vote. I mean, it seems, seems to me you know, you have to show ID to get on an airplane. Uh, you have to show ID, um, you know, in, in sometimes in the summer, 
uh, we like to go to church at the Chapel of the Transfiguration, which is actually in the park. And so you you have to show ID to get to church because you've got to show ID to get into the park. And it just occurs to me, I don't know why you wouldn't have to show ID to, to vote. Um, uh, I have another question from uh, a, an alum, uh, Eunice, on it's bad for democracy to have the Republican Party taken over by an irrational faction. What is the hope for our two party structure is now the time for a viable third party? Since you're running to be the nominee of a second party, probably not the best question to ask, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to challenge your <laughs> the underlying assumption of your question. <laughs> there, but I, I don't be, look, I am firmly committed to rebuilding the Republican Party. Um, I think the, the first part of the question uh, uh, is, is right, um, that we, we cannot have a party that's built around a cult of personality. Uh, and I think that's bad for the country. And I think the Republican Party, uh, you know, the, I think we're the third oldest political party maybe in the world and, and, you know, have an unbelievably proud and honorable tradition as the party of Lincoln. And the way we, we win elections is on substance and policy and ideas. And, and that's what we have to get back to. And uh, I think we will be condemning ourselves to, to losing a lot of elections if, if we don't clearly condemn what happened and, and, and embrace the Constitution as, as you know, we're bound to do. And we have a, a final question from Sophie Hare, a, a student in the uh, college, and she's, I think, with us on screen. Hello. Hi, Representative Cheney. My name is Sophie. I'm a second year in the college. Um, I've watched as you took a principled stand and paid a high price. And I guess as a student who's looking to head to Washington when she graduates, I'm curious if you think it's still possible to be principled and effective as a legislator in D.C. Well, I, I do. Um, and I think the country requires it. And, and I know a lot of principled and effective legislators uh, on both sides of the aisle in Washington. Um, they, they don't always get the attention uh, that um, some of the unprincipled people do. Um, uh, but but I, the vast majority of uh, our elected officials really are in office for the right reasons. Um, they really do want to do what's right for their constituents and, and help to make the country better. Um, but I would also say we, we our system depends upon um, the character of the people we elect. And so young people like yourself uh, getting engaged and getting involved really matters. I think we've seen that our system can be fragile and, and it really depends upon goodwill and character and principle of people who are in office. So um, I hope that, that you will be encouraged to participate, whether it's running for office or coming to work in Washington and public policy. Thank Thanks, you. Sophie. Representative Cheney, uh, so, uh, so happy that you could join uh, today. You know, we, um, we, we, we don't see all that many examples of people who are willing to uh, risk, uh, risk their political neck uh, for principles. And that's why uh, what you did and what you've done uh, since January 6th has stood out. Um, I don't want to say more than that because I don't want to destroy your political future in <laughs> Wyoming. Uh, but uh, but I, as an American, I do appreciate it. And as someone who loves this democracy, I, I, I appreciate it. So thank you for uh, being with us. Thank you for being at the Institute of Politics. Thank you for speaking to our alums today. And uh, good luck in the future. Well, thank you. And, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that when I was at the University of Chicago Law School, there were two professors there. One was named Barack Obama and one was named Elena Kagan. And uh, I didn't have uh, President Obama as a professor, but I, I did take civil procedure from Elena Kagan and uh, loved her as a professor because she didn't let politics into uh, the law school classroom. So uh, it was a wonderful place to be and really formative experience and uh, really enjoyed being with you today. So thanks well, for well you're welcome. Think of how history could have changed if you had had Professor Obama. <laughs> I don't think good. it would have been good, David. <laughs> <laughs> good to be with you. You too. Thank, Thank you. you.